Hello everyone and welcome back to this nanophotonics and plasmonics course. Uh, today we're going to cover this uh, second part of chapter 8 on surface plasmons. Now that we introduced the classical electrodynamics framework and derived the Jude model for metal, we are ready to dive into surface plasmon proratons. Uh, so those surface plasmon proratons or SPPs are quanta of surface charge density oscillations. So classically uh, they are just solutions of Maxwell's equations that can be calculated uh, for certain boundary conditions. Uh, so that's SPPs are just a combination of charge oscillation in the middle, uh, that's the surface plasma part of the SPP term, and electromagnetic waves uh, in a dielectric medium, uh, and that's the polaritonic part of this uh, SPP term. So let's first uh, consider a planar interface between two medium, epsilon 1 and epsilon 2. Uh, we can actually uh, solve Maxwell's equations, like that they're homogeneous solutions with just the, the, the eigenmodes, or in other words, the just solutions in absence of external uh, excitation. Uh, so those solutions uh, are also solutions of the wave equations that we discussed extensively uh, in chapter 2. So if you solve those wave equations separately in medium 1 and medium 2, and then you ap uh, apply the proper boundary condition at the interface between the, the two media, then you end up with a set of two different solutions. So you have uh, basically the P polarized modes or TM modes, uh, transverse magnetic, where the magnetic field is actually transverse to the plane of incidence, which is formed by the K vector and the normal to the, um, to the interface. And then you have those S polarized modes or TE transverse electric modes, where the electric field is transverse to the, to, to the plane of incidence. Uh, now, the problem is that those, uh, those S polarized um, excitations cannot actually excite the electromagnetic mode uh, at the surface of the, the interface. Uh, so if you have an electric field which is parallel to the interface, you cannot excite in-plane um, propagating mode. Uh, so this can be done only with the TM modes. So if you, uh, if you look at the TM modes, uh, then you, you end up with uh, electric field, uh, which are solutions of the wave equation that have uh, this form. So you have the electric field uh, in medium one and medium two. Uh, so you have the X component, which is the, the component parallel to the interface. And then you have the Z component, which is the component orthogonal or, uh, to, the, to the interface. These modes have a, a wave vector parallel to the interface. Uh, so that's the, the KX component. Uh, and this must be conserved uh, as you cross the interface, meaning that the uh, Kx1 in medium 1 must be equal to Kx2 in medium 2 as you cross the interface. Uh, and now you just can label that as Kx. So with this uh, conservation of momentum, then you can, you can write this simple expression connecting the, uh, the, the momentum or the wave, num the wave number K to the, to, uh, to the, the component Kx and, and Kz in both medium 1 and medium 2. Because the field uh, that we calculated, the electric field must satisfy the Gauss law, uh, so therefore the, the divergence of the electric displacement or divergence of the electric field uh, must be equal to zero in this case. That leads to this simple expression that when you derive uh, the uh, electric field that we had on the previous slide with respect to the x, y, z component, that's what you end up with. So uh, the boundary conditions must be satisfied as well. Uh, so we need to make sure that the, uh, the pile component of the electric field and the transverse component of the electric displacement uh, are actually continuous across the interface. And that leads to those two expressions. With those uh, two relations coming from the boundary condition, uh, this relation coming from Gauss law and the previous relation that we derived on the previous slide coming from the conservation of the momentum then we end up with a set of four equations that need to be solved. Uh, and to solve those system of four equations, we just make, need to make sure that this, co uh, this determinant is actually zero. Uh, so we have to solve two possibilities. So we can either set Kx equals zero, but Kx equals zero means that we are at normal incidence and therefore uh, we cannot have any propagating mode. So if there's no X component, there's nothing propagating along the surface. So this is not interesting. Uh, and the only physical um, propagating mode can be obtained when this term in parentheses is actually equal to zero. So if you do so, then you end up with uh, Kz1, which is uh, proportional to Kz2. So um, we can use this uh, this term uh, along with uh, those two 
uh, those two equations that we uh, we uh, we obtain uh, from the conservation of the momentum. So the, if you manipulate those two equations, it's fairly easy to show that the x component of the k vector uh, and the z component of the k vector in medium one and medium two are actually connected to uh, to the wave number k uh, with those terms. Uh, so if you if you remember that the, the wave number k is actually omega over c. Then you end up with the, the dispersion relations uh, for in-plane and out-of-plane uh, out directions for the SPPs at the interface. If we go back to this interface, uh, now we know that we have those uh, bound modes that are propagating along the, uh, the X direction. Uh, because they are bound states, uh, they are evanescent along the direction uh, orthogonal to the interface, which is the Z directions. We have an evanescent field. Uh, and starting from the dispersion relations before, we can actually determine what are the conditions uh, to form those, uh, those evanescent waves at the interface. And this is satisfied only when uh, epsilon 1 times epsilon 2 is negative and uh, epsilon 1 plus epsilon 2 is also negative. So those two conditions under the electric permittivities for medium 1 and medium 2 actually translate the fact that uh, kx uh, must be real. So we have we need to have a real component of the wave member, wave vector along the interface. And that kz is actually purely imaginary. So this is the, the definition of an evanescent wave. In practice, uh, what does that mean? It means that the, the real part of one of the two that permittivities, either epsilon one or epsilon two must be negative. And this is the case of metal. Uh, so if we have a, a metal dielectric interface, then you can uh, you can satisfy those equations and therefore sustain bound waves that are propagating along the interface and that are evanescent uh, in the direction orthogonal to the interface. Uh, so this is what uh, what uh, you can you can picture if you look at the electric field loss of the evanescent waves. So you see that they can propagate along the interface uh, uh, while they actually uh, decay exponentially as you move away from the, the interface. So we can actually plot these dispersion relations on the diagram, uh, which is just showing the, the frequency uh, of those uh, modes uh, as a function of the X component of the, the K vector along the, the interface. So this yellow line is the light cone or the light line. So that's the dispersion of uh, light in free space, uh, which is just a linear dispersion relation between omega and the wave number and the dispersion uh, relation is proportional in that case to, to the speed of light uh, in free space. Now, if light propagates in a, in a dielectric medium of refractive index n, uh, then this light line uh, tilts uh, and decreases by this coefficient n, which is the, the refractive index where light is propagating. Going back for a minute to, uh, to the free electrons or the, the, bulk, uh, the bulk plasma, uh, this is coming directly from the Drude model. So if you look at the Drude model in the um, undamped case, where basically you just neglect the, the damping term gamma, uh, or we'll consider basically uh, large frequencies omega, which are much larger than gamma, uh, then you can show that you, uh, you have this uh, dispersion relation, uh, omega squared, which is uh, omega p squared, which is the bulk plasma frequency, and then we have this k squared, c squared. Uh, and that... If you plot that on this diagram, you obtain this, uh, this, blue, uh, this blue line. And this is the bulk plasma per atom. If you look at uh, the, the case where kx equals zero, basically you have absolutely no light coming in. Uh, then you basically this, uh, this is just equal to the bulk plasma frequency. So you have just the bulk plasma uh, oscillation. Uh, for the SPPs that we just calculated, so we just extracted the, uh, the dispersion relation. So this is the parallel dispersion relation, so the, the KSPP, the momentum of this SPP is the, the KX. Uh, if you plot this, you obtain the, the red line, so that is what, what you, you obtain, the dispersion relation of those surface plasma polaritons. Um, as you increase the K vector uh, further and further, you see that this approaches a certain limit, which is omega P over square root of, uh, of two. So that's the, the surface plasma. So we have the bulk plasma and that omega P, and then we have the surface plasma at omega p over square root of two. So those two values are uh, when there's no external optical excitation. So there's no external electromagnetic field coupling to, this, uh, to these oscillations. 
Uh, now, when you actually cap all to those oscillations, then you, uh, you have those dispersions uh, that are changing the energy of the modes, uh, as now you have those uh, plasmon uh, polaritons, uh, which are coupled uh, charge oscillations with electromagnetic waves. Um, so it's important to notice that neither the, this red line, so the SPP, nor the blue line, or the bulk plasmon, uh, cross this uh, yellow line here, which is the white line. Therefore, it means that you cannot excite directly those SPPs or those bulk plasmon polaritons with electromagnetic waves. Uh, there's a momentum mismatch. So that you cannot find any energy on this diagram where light can provide enough momentum to be able to excite the, the SPPs. Um, so therefore, uh, we can wonder how do we actually excite those SPPs. So there are basically two solutions. So the first solution is to just to provide this missing momentum by changing from free space to a dielectric medium, refractive index n. So we just show that uh, when you have light propagating in certain medium of refractive index n, then you can tilt the light line, and therefore you can just bring the light line uh, onto uh, the dispersion relation of the, uh, the SPP, and therefore uh, create enough momentum to be able to excite those SPPs. So this is uh, something which is uh, done uh, in two different configurations that have been introduced in the 1960s. Uh, the auto configuration, which is on the, on the left-hand side, and the Kretschmann configuration, which is on the right-hand side. So we have a metal film, and then we have a glass prism, uh, which is at the bottom. So we send light through the glass prism, then now we have light propagating in this uh, dielectric medium uh, with a certain refractive index. Uh, we can create uh, evanescent waves at the glass-air interface, and those evanescent waves in turn will actually uh, carry on this extra momentum uh, because they are, they are generated from the glass and therefore excite the SPP on the, on the metal-air interface. Uh, in terms of uh, Kretschmann configuration, so it's fairly similar. So you send light through the glass prism, you now uh, have enough momentum uh, to generate evanescent waves at the glass metal interface. Uh, and then uh, you can use this um, extra momentum to excite the SPP on the other interface of the metallic film, uh, which is the, the metal air interface. Two comments on that. Uh, the first one is that on the Kretschmann, you can clearly see that what you need basically to have a metallic film, which is uh, thin, thin enough, uh, which is uh, with a thickness smaller than the skin depth. Uh, which is just the, the, the maximum penetration of the distance of the electromagnetic fields within this metal. And this can be calculated by taking the, the inverse of the Z component of the, the K vector in the, in the metal. So you can calculate how far light will propagate in the metal here and design a metallic film with a thickness smaller than that. Uh, in terms of this uh, air gap in the auto configuration, same thing. So we need to make sure that the, the metal is not too far uh, so that the there's actually uh, an interaction between the evanescent waves and, this, and, the, and the film. The second solution, which is also used to excite uh, SPPs, is basically just to use gratings, which are just periodic patterns to provide this, uh, this missing momentum. So simply, so if you have a metallic surface uh, and you have this, uh, this grating pattern, uh, which is just protrusion of the, the, of, of, of the metal, so the metallic surface, uh, so it does a periodic CDP, uh, then basically you can provide uh, through the block theorem, through this periodicity, you can provide an additional uh, reciprocal uh, lattice vector G, uh, which is just given by uh, 2 pi over P, which is a periodicity. And then you can excite uh, the SPP using this additional uh, momentum coming from, uh, from the grading. Um, going back to uh, other Gretschmann configurations, looking at some experimental uh, measurements, uh, the auto configuration on the left, the Kretschmann configuration on the right. Uh, so they excite the, the SPP using 133 nanometers wavelength. So those different curves, so this is the reflectivity measurement. So when you have high reflectivity, it means that the excitations are bouncing back uh, from the, the, the glass uh, air interface here. And when you have a low reflectivity, it means that the, the energy is being transferred to, for the formation of those SPPs. Uh, similar here. So these numbers uh, represent different uh, gap uh, separations here. So the, this is the, the, the distance between the, uh, the glass and the, and the metal in nanometers. 
Uh, so you can see that when the, the gap is uh, 200 nanometers, so that's the smallest distance, uh, see that you have now a broad SPP resonance, uh, which is very damped. Uh, and this is because the, uh, the SPP radiation damping is actually increased. So what that means is that basically the SPP is formed and because of the close proximity with the, the, surf, the, the interface, those SPP modes are actually interacting back with the evanescent waves that are formed at the glass air interface. Now on the other end, if you're looking at uh, very large distances, uh, 1000 nanometers, uh, then basically uh, you're very far from the surface and there's a very little interaction between the evanescent wave and the SPP uh, and therefore you, you cannot excite very efficiently uh, the SPP. So you need to, to find the optimal case, uh, in this case it's about 600 nanometers, uh, this is where you, you can most uh, efficiently excite the SPP. Richman configuration is fairly similar, so if you're looking at the uh, Felix film which is very thin, uh, then basically you have also a back coupling between the SPP uh, and the evanescent waves uh, on each uh, side of the, the metallic film. So now if you look at uh, very large uh, thick films uh, like 80 nanometers uh, of thickness, uh, then be uh, basically this means that the, uh, the, the field does not propagate far enough uh, before, before dying and then that basically the thickness is much larger than the, the skin depth uh, in, this, in this particular metal and you cannot excite very efficiently the SPPs. So same thing here. So we need to find uh, an optimal thickness, which is about 50 nanometers in order to excite efficiently the, uh, the SPP. Now let's uh, look at some uh, numerical simulation that can be actually done uh, using FDTD. So this simulation uh, models the Kretschmann configuration where you have a glass uh, substrate that models the, the glass prism. Uh, we have a, a metallic film, which is just uh, silver in this case, with a thickness of 62.3 nanometers. Uh, and then we can calculate the reflectivity uh, of the reflection spectrum from, from this, uh, this system. Uh, so this is done for a citation of 502.5 nanometers wavelength. And then we, we observe a very large deep uh, at about 46 uh, degrees. Uh, so this is uh, an angle resolved uh, reflectivity measurement. Uh, we can compare uh, these calculations with experiments that have been performed by uh, Kretschmann in 1971 uh, using different wavelengths. So you see that when you use this uh, wavelength of uh, 502.5 like us, uh, you obtain the exact same angle as SPPs are actually formed. We can look at uh, the dispersion relations. Uh, we can actually calculate those dispersion relations using FDTD. Uh, so this is what you obtain. So you have the light line uh, for the for air. So this is the, the free space propagation of, of light uh, in, in vacuum or in air. This is the propagation of light in glass. And then we obtain two curves. Uh, so those two curves are actually the SPP uh, at the middle air interface. So this is the SPP forming at the, uh, on the upper surface of the, the metallic film. And we have also SPP forming at the glass uh, metal interface, which is a little bit lower. So you see that uh, for SPP in air, it doesn't cross the uh, light line in air, and for the SPP in glass, it does not cross the uh, light line in glass. However, the SPP in air intersects the light line in the glass medium, and this is exactly what we, we look for. So uh, for this particular case, we're going to be able to excite uh, the SPP. So uh, this value here, uh, the, the limit of this SPP in air uh, is actually the surface plasmon in, of silver. This is uh, 3.66 electron volt. And then uh, this is the excitation uh, that we used in, uh, in the previous experiment. So uh, 502 nanometers wavelength correspond to an energy of 2.5 electron volts. So that's our SPP. So the SPP uh, is actually here. So because the SPP is here, you see that the light in this uh, glass medium actually uh, provides more momentum. So that's basically providing momentum uh, to excite this particular SPP. So now we can do the same for a different type of configuration. So this is aluminum, 20 nanometers thickness. We can actually calculate the reflectivity spectrum as well. So 
because aluminum we, we use uh, lower wavelengths, so 266 nanometers of excitation. Uh, we observe the, the SPP forming at about the same thing, 46 uh, degrees. Uh, this is the experiment that has been performed in 2016 on similar system. See that we have a perfect agreement uh, between experiments and our uh, computational model. We can also calculate uh, similarly the uh, dispersion diagram for this particular uh, aluminum film. Uh, so same thing, we have the light line uh, in vacuum or in air, the light line uh, which is uh, in, in glass, the SPP in air, the SPP in glass. Uh, in that particular case, you see that the, the energy is much higher because we are in aluminum. Uh, so we have a, a surface plasmon of 10.3 uh, electron volts. Uh, so 266 nanometers uh, correspond to an energy of 4.7 electron volts. So we're looking at this particular surface plasmon polariton uh, mode, and that's basically the uh, the light line here that provides uh, the momentum to excite this, this SPP. Finally, for gold, uh, I won't comment all the, the details. Uh, gold, 53 nanometers uh, of thickness. Same thing, a very good agreement between our uh, calculated refractivity uh, spectrum, angle resolve spectrum. We've experiments from 2006. Uh, we have uh, the two light lines in, in glass and in air. We have our surface plasmons at 2.6 electron volt uh, with the SPPs in air and in glass. And for an, an excitation of 633 nanometers, it correspond to an energy of 1.96 electron volt, which is located right here. Something which is also important to notice, you see that basically the, the SPP here uh, is not very clear is because we have those interband transitions that are basically blocking uh, or preventing us from resolving clearly the, the SPP. So uh, if you go back to the previous uh, gold, uh, silver and aluminum, we have nice SPP dispersions. Uh, here you see that it basically stops and vanishes. It's not very clear it's because of the presence of the interband transitions in that uh, high energy region. The surface plasmons and the bulk plasmons uh, have been observed in yields. Uh, in original works uh, by uh, Powell and Swan uh, in uh, 1959 and 1960. Uh, so these are uh, things that we're going to be discussing when we're going to be talking about eels as well. This is basically what, what they observed. So they, they have done uh, eels measurements and they observed two peaks in the spectrum that correspond to the bulk, uh, to the bulk plasmon and the surface plasmons that show up also here in those experiments. So they have the surface plasmons uh, that is at lower energy uh, and the bulk plasmon that shows up at high energies. Uh, so these are the dispersion relations that we just saw. Uh, so imagine that you just, just cut in half, so this is symmetric. So you have the dispersion relation, those, uh, those different modes uh, that show up in EELS as well. Um, what about uh, some applications of the SPP? So I'm going to go very quickly because we're going to see that later on. So we can use them as a sensor, so we can use uh, for biosensing, so you have a metallic film. Uh, you send light, like in a, in a auto encroachment configuration. Uh, you can flow um, a macrofluidic channel here with whatever you want to probe, and you can use the evanescent fields from the SPPs to actually sense and interact with those uh, those tiny objects, whether it's molecules or other particles. Uh, so you have those evanescent fields that interact with uh, with uh, different systems. Uh, you can also use them for surface and in spectroscopies, and we're going to discuss this extensively as well. Uh, so we can use the, the roughness provided uh, to provide additional momentum, a little bit like your grading, uh, in order to excite the SPPs and those evanescent waves when they interact with uh, molecules, uh, and then we can uh, we can probe the type of molecule uh, via uh, surface and in and spectroscopy. Uh, we can also use them uh, for waveguides. So once again, we're going to discuss waveguides uh, extensively. Uh, as well later on, so I will not necessarily uh, discuss this uh, too much, but we can really uh, design and have those SPP waves propagating along uh, very uh, specific patterns uh, over fairly long distances. Uh, and the, the beauty of it is that they are well confined within those channels. Uh, these are just uh, key properties. Uh, I don't want you to memorize them. This is just to give you order of uh, magnitudes for those quantities. Uh, so we have different materials, uh, gold, silver, aluminum, copper, and magnesium. So the principle 
uh, plasmodic materials. So we have the, the free electron density, which uh, gives you the, uh, the bulk plasmon energy. So the higher the density, uh, the, the higher the bulk plasmon uh, energy. So we have the end screen and screen uh, as, as, a, as a reminder. So we have uh, the, the bulk plasmon over the square root of uh, epsilon infinity for the screen, which is taking into account the screening from the core uh, valence electrons. Uh, we have also the Fermi energy, uh, and you have more references if you want to dive into that. Uh, so this is, I think, important to notice that gold and silver are fairly similar, uh, but on the other hand, aluminum and then uh, higher as well, magnesium in terms of bulk plasmon energy. So uh, this basically summarizes what we saw in this chapter. Uh, so we discussed about the history of plasmons, uh, looking at the, the funding, uh, funding work, theoretical experiments, uh, the relationship with uh, the band structures, uh, so discussing the effect of the, the S and the D bands. Uh, we uh, came back to the electric dynamics uh, of noble metals uh, and derived the Drude sum of the uh, models. We discussed the interband transitions and uh, how to actually take them into account uh, via the Drude Lorentz model. And then we discussed uh, the surface plasmon polaritons themselves. And we discuss about the, the auto encroachment configurations with some computational modeling to illustrate those, those effects.